Amen. We want to welcome everyone to the River of Life Wednesday night Bible study. Amen. Welcome to you, all of you on live stream there. Hello from, from River of Life in Phoenix. We welcome you. Everyone's gathering in, coming for a tremendous night of prayer and a teaching from our Debbie Fisher tonight. So as everyone takes their seats, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that from the rising of the sun, to the setting of the same, we are a people who do show forth your praise. Father, we thank you tonight as we are coming. People across the entire earth via the live stream, we pray, Father, for blessing and peace. We pray for your joy to fill us because your joy is our strength. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your wraparound love. We thank you, Father, that your goodness and your grace and your peace is in the house tonight. And with that, I want to introduce and welcome our Debbie. And let's give her a round of applause. Amen. Good evening, family. Good evening. Oh, Lord Jesus, I need to pray just a little bit more. Father, I thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to come and to break, word, break bread tonight to speak your word, Lord God, to fellowship with friends and family that love you, Lord. Father, I plead the blood of Jesus over my mouth. I pray that I would only speak the words that you have given me to speak, Lord, that I would speak in truth to the best of my ability, Lord God, and that I would deliver your word that would be as sharper than a two-edged sword, that it would reach those parts, Lord, and change us and rearrange us, Lord. I thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. I thank you for the trust of my leadership to allow me to do this, Lord. I thank you for my family that came to support me. <laughs> my knees are knocking, but it's okay because this is a safe place to learn and to grow. I've been here for a long time. You all know my failures. You know my shortcomings, and I know that I can be real. And I just want to share and give you strength and grab strength from you for me. Um, like I said, I've been at the river for a long time, 27 years. I can't believe it's been that long. Hoo-wee. Um, but not everybody knows my story. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my Jesus story. Um, I'm a native to Arizona. I was born in Yuma, grew up in Flagstaff, and then been down in the valley most of my adult life. Um, I don't ever remember not being aware of Jesus, but I wouldn't say that I was raised in the church. Uh, my grandmother went to a Catholic church, and she would come and get us, come and get me often and take me to church. I did the catechisms, the communion classes, but I don't think I ever received salvation there. I didn't have that kiss of deity, that transforming mo moment. I don't know when I was saved, but I've got a couple of ideas. When I was 12, um, my grandmother was still attending the Catholic Church, and she went to a women's aglow meeting, which was a meeting that women from all different churches would come together. And she had just got diagnosed with diabetes, and they wanted her to start insulin shots, and my grandmother was terrified. So she went to this Women's Aglow meeting, and she asked for prayer. Well, she got slain in the spirit. It had never happened to her before. And she got healed of diabetes. She never took an insulin shot never ever had one other struggle of diabetes and she died at 95 healthy of everything except for the stroke and the Alzheimer's so you know um, so after my grandma got healed she left the Catholic Church and she found a spirit filled church about that time uh, at 12, 13, I was entering into my wild teens, and my father died when I was 12. So after my dad died, I was living with my grandparents, and they shipped me off to Las Vegas to live with my mom. 
my mom lived in a trailer park and the woman that ran the trailer park had a Bible study and she invited me and my mom and she gave me my very first Bible and I think I probably asked Jesus into my life in her living room but I don't remember for sure so uh, after we moved back to Flagstaff from Vegas about a year later and when I was 14 my best friend died on her way to my house she was hit on her bicycle on the way to my house so her dad owns her family owned a, a hotel in Flagstaff the oldest one there is the Weatherford and we used to go when we would spend the weekends at the hotel and we'd sneak out and we would go down to the college bars by NAU so on the night of her funeral was one of the weekends that we had planned to go out. It was a Friday. She died on a Tuesday, um, and if her funeral was on Friday. And I went out afterwards, and coming out of the bar at 1 o'clock in the morning, 14 years old, drunk, I was greeted by a group of street evangelists. <laughs> and I was broken. And, and I mean, I was at a point where it was like, I knew I needed God. I knew I needed change in my life. So I ended up hooking up with that church. Um, I attended their court classes, um, went to church. They had worship. <laughs> On weekends, they would gather together and worship, and we had all these rules. You couldn't watch TV, you couldn't listen to the radio, but we had youth worship that was all the worldly songs with the lyrics changed. And it was like, well, wait a minute, you gotta listen to the real deal before you can put new lyrics in here. And it was just, it, it became such a legalistic church that I left there at the age of 15 I was li by by then I had my own apartment I was living on my own and it was like this is just too hard I can't be good enough for Jesus there was just too many rules so but God continued uh, God continued to chase me down and during this time my grandma would always want me to come to church with her. So one Sunday I went to church with her just to make her happy. Well, this was the new church. This is the spirit-filled church. I've never been to a place like this before. And I walked in and they were worshiping and they had their hands up. And it was like, this is new. This is really new. But it wasn't the hands up. It was what I felt all around me, that holy hush the holiness of the presence of God. And even though I was far from him and I was way deep in sin, I still knew that presence was something that I wanted. Um, and then, and then, the pastor gets up and starts telling his story of how he's a heroin addict and Jesus found him in a ditch with a needle in his arms. I had never heard somebody be so truthful before. And I was like, he's a heroin addict? And he's in the pulpit? There's hope for me. Because at that time, I wasn't that bad. <laughs> at that time. I was like, there's hope, you know? So I got excited. And you would have thought I would have surrendered. I was like, mm-mm. Took another 15 years. 15 years of sin and, and destruction found myself in Phoenix in 1994, divorced, lost custody of my kids due to drugs. I was homeless, and I was broken. And I knew I needed God. I was with a friend. I was living on her couch, and I talked her into going to churches with me. I said, I've got to go find a church. i got to find a church like my grandma's and she said well what's special about your grandma's and I said I don't know but I'll feel it I'll know it when I find it so we spent a couple months and every weekend we would go to another church here and there and just nothing ever ever stuck and one Saturday morning in June we were having coffee and there was a knock on the door and it was this teenager that had a bright neon mohawk and I'm not talking a little mohawk 
I'm talking like an eight inch mohawk that went from here shoot all the I, this is the punk rock days this is the one the punk rockers were coming out and that thing went all the way back and I told my friend I said oh Tammy you got to let me li answer the door I got this one I got this one what does this dude want so I opened the door and he says hey they're having a, a march for Jesus down here in Phoenix you you want to come down to the parade with us and I said what church do you go to <laughs> it's like I want to know what church you go to with that mohawk and you want to invite me to Jesus and he's like oh the river of life I was like all right so we didn't go to that parade and I wrote the name of the church down and then forgot all about it took me two months to find you guys again <laughs> it was the old building and when I came into the building I sat in the runaway section you know in the back the back couple rows yeah by the way if you sit in the back couple rows here I've prayed for you before you sit in those chairs and I've asked angels to hold you to speak to you to call your heart into the kingdom so if you don't want to sit in an anointed chair you better come forward when you come to church <laughs> so, so when I came into this church this is this is this was the day that if I was already saved if I wasn't saved yet this was the day I became saved I was sitting in the run row seats and Pastor Brian was prophesying on the piano and Beth was dancing with two huge white flags and all of a sudden Pastor Brian stopped playing but Beth didn't stop dancing and those white flags whipped in the air. And every time that flag would crack through the atmosphere, I would feel like chunks feel falling off of me. And the only way I can explain it, my dad was a diesel truck driver, so the chains that he used were big. And I felt like I was wrapped in one of those chains. And as Beth worshiped the Lord, those chains just began to fall off of me. And I stood back there that day and just cried. And I said, Lord, 15 years ago, I invited you into my life. And then I turned and ran the opposite direction. But today, I give you my life. And, you know, salvation is free. But walking it out is not. It cost me everything when I gave my life to Jesus. I lost friends. I mean, I had to make cut and dry decisions. It was like, I don't want to, I don't want to be at the bars anymore. I don't want to be snorting, snorting coke anymore. I'm done. I don't want it. I'm going to make new friends. And I decided I was going to plug in. And I am so grateful of how alive this church is because we had the arts going on. We had to Helen back. And my kids were little, and my son wanted to be a movie star. So it was such a great place for him to plug in. But both my kids gave their lives to the Lord during to hell and back. Um, I, I plugged into the dance team. I, I, I joined the dance team. Back then, you didn't just join, and then on Sunday, you stand up here on the line. No, there was you could join once a year, and then we had to take a six-week class to learn why we were dancing, why we were worshiping, and that, you know, it's not fun and games. We're here for a purpose, and we're here to serve. But that's the key word purpose. I think that's why my life changed when I came to the river is because when I came here, I found purpose. The first thing Lee did was he put me to work. I don't even know how it started. I mean, I hadn't been here long. I think he knew I was just a single struggling mom and I wanted Jesus and he knew get her plugged in, put her to work. So I answered phones on Sunday mornings. I would be at the church at 7 a.m. 
service didn't start till nine, but Lee wanted me there in case somebody called and needed directions. That's the only reason I was there to answer the phone was if somebody needed directions. I think I answered those phones for five years, and I think I gave answered it once. <laughs> but I was there every Sunday, and I felt so privileged because I was the first one to see Lee. I got to see him before the rest of you did. I got five minutes with him every Sunday morning. <laughs> Those five minutes are precious. <laughs> they weren't given up easily. So I felt so valued. It was the first time I had purpose. I had purpose that was something that was bigger than me. You know, we raise our children. Those are our purpose. We feel good to be parents. We seek college educations and careers because we're looking for the, that purpose. But the purpose that really fulfills you is serving God. When you find your purpose in the house, you become a part of something that's bigger than you. I, I'm, I'm in the midst of something that's huge. I know God's doing something, and it's big, and I'm right in the middle of it, and I have purpose. I don't know what my purpose is, and, and before coming here, I even asked God, what, you know, what is my purpose? And I don't think he's going to tell me, because I'd probably run. <laughs> I'd be like, mm -mm, that ain't for me. See ya. <laughs> I'm just a servant. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a prophet. I'm not an evangelist. I'm just a servant. <laughs> and that's where I'm most happy because that gives me purpose. That's my purpose in life. So when Lee passed, yeah. Before Lee passed, something else happened that I have to share. All right. So in 2013, I started becoming stagnant. I was like, I wasn't feeling the Holy Spirit at church anymore. It's like something's missing. Maybe it's time for me to leave the river. I used to pray all the time, Lord, don't ever ask me to leave the river because I'll never leave here. But I know not to say never. So I was like, okay, maybe the Lord's asking me to leave. So I went and checked out another church, and these were people that I knew and I loved and I knew their ministry. So I decided I was going to become a part of them. Well, their service would be finished about the time right before. They finished at 930, which gave me time to get here at 10. And there's just no place like the river when it comes to worship. So it's like, hmm. all right, I'll just, I'll run to the river afterwards. One morning I was standing behind Tiff. And I was like, God, what's missing? Why don't I feel you anymore? What's missing? And he said, you are. Stop coming to get and come to serve. And I went, and I didn't go back to the other church. And I came back, and I've committed. And I've been here since. 2014, my son overdosed on pain pills. That rocked my world. Stephen overcame a kidney transplant, open heart surgery, and then got hooked on the stupid pain pills from it. And he was my, he was my everything about my faith. He was what I was believing for. He was my purpose for life. He was going to get healed. He was going to go preach the word. I was going to be his mama back in the corner praying for him. I just knew that's how God was going to play this picture out. And then Stephen died. I thought it was going to take me out. It should have taken me out. But it didn't. It catapulted me into a place. I allowed myself one year to grieve, but I never stopped coming to church. I never stopped wor worshiping. But God had to hold me. It was, it was a rough, rough time. But you know what? God held me so 
miraculously, so undeniably, y'all watch me walk through it. I came out okay. I came out better. You know, and it's like this is what God is capable of doing. Don't give up. Don't faint because it the days are going to be better. You know, now I'm standing in the same place. And I'm believing again for the same kind of miracle. But I'm not afraid because I know no matter what, happens our God's gonna come through so so I get to have faith without the fear of me failing we know that God's never gonna fail but but it's us who fails it's us who falls short it's us who just doesn't cut it and it's like but I know that God's not gonna fail me I didn't get what I want it didn't turn out the way I liked but man, God gave me something I didn't even know existed. I didn't even know that I could feel this much faith. I didn't know that I could feel this content in the storms. But you know what? I've had the worst storm happen, and I survived. So we're going to be okay. We're going to survive this storm too. All right, let's get to the word. Miss V, help me with time because I forgot my watch. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Actually, will someone bring me my phone out of my purse so I at least have that so I can check? Um, the scripture that I want to break down tonight is 1 Kings 11.38. And as we're reading it, I want you to think about our Bible we know that this is the word of God, that there's life in it. It's transforming. You keep putting it in front of your eyes. You keep speaking it out of your mouth. You keep it there. And it's going to transform you. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't go, oh, I did it for a month and it didn't work. I don't feel any different. Keep going. Stick in it. I've been in it 27 years. And I still haven't even touched a little bit of it. This is a history book. These are real people, real events. They really did these things. This is a book that is applicable in the physical, and it's applicable in the spiritual realm. In the physical realm, it says that I can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. In the physical realm, it says that I can cast out demons. In the physical realm, right here on earth, right now, today, the physical realm, I am the lender and not the borrower. Find out who you are in here. You're the head, not the tail. You're blessed in the city and in the field. You're blessed when you come in and when you go out. Find out who you are so you can speak it and you can say it over yourselves. Hoo-wee, thank you, Lord. All right, 1 Kings 11.38. Then it shall be, if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight to keep my statutes and my commandments as my servant David did then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David and will give Israel to you there's a nugget in here that I want that I want and I want it for myself and I want it for you and that nugget is the Lord says, I will be with you and build for you an enduring house. God's going to build it, not me, him. And what is, what is, what is, the, what is an enduring house? The first house we have is the house that God lives in, our hearts. Our hearts, our lives, that's the first house that we need to be thinking about. 
The second house we have is our home, our families, our friends, and places that we fellowship. And then the other home is our church home. And that's my heart's desire tonight, is that my church home would be an enduring house. That my church family would be an enduring family. That our, our marriages endure. Our children endure. Our bank accounts endure. Our health endures. What does endure mean? Endure, lasting, continuing, without perishing, bearing, sustaining, supporting with patience, without opposition or yielding, lasting long and permanent. So it says, so, uh, okay. One of the things I've learned is we never take scripture out of context. So I can't just pick what I want and be like, oh, this looks so good. Let's eat it and forget about everything else. Okay. So the context of this scripture comes from King Solomon. He's lived his life. Now we know King Solomon is David's son. And in chapter 10, he meets up with Queen of Sheba. He's, he's in his splendor, Solomon's splendor. Chapter 11, he engages with wives and other gods, and the next thing you know, the adversary's coming that God sent, and Solomon's losing it all. He's near the end of his life. He's had all this wisdom. He asked God to give him wisdom. He had wisdom like nobody. People from all over came, but that wisdom didn't keep him from sinning. That wisdom didn't keep him from from turning from God. That's harsh. That's harsh. All right, so it says, then it shall be. What will be? God will build an enduring house if, that little big word, if, if you heed. That word heed means hearken, and it's the same word that Pastor Brian's been teaching us of the Shema or Shema. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And I'm going to read that real quick. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be at frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and your gates. Where's the doorpost of our house? Our hearts. We need the word in us so much that it is engraved on our hearts that that it it comes up when you need it most and you'll be surprised because it does today all kinds came up in me and i was like wow i do know more than i thought that's pretty cool all right <laughs> All right, so that word sh shema means to, to hear intelligently with attention and obedience. So it doesn't do any good to just sit out here and listen. You can hear and listen all you want, but if there's no attention and there's no obedience, there's not going to be any change. There's not going to be any building. There's not going to be any enduring. All, all right. Uh, so, then it shall be, if you heed, all that I command you. So, we learned this week that there's 613 commandments tied on a tallit. Not going to happen, Lord. 
I struggle with the 10. So tonight we're not, we're just going to talk, let's, we're just going to take one commandment. We're just going to take one. We're going to take the first one. We're going to take the first commandment, and that's all we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to say, I do that, and we're good to go. What's the first commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Are you loving the Lord with all your heart, with all that you got? with all your tears, with all your frustrations, with all your hopes, with all your disappointments, with all your losses, with all your gains. Love them with your whole heart. What does Jesus say about the commandments, you know? Ron's always telling us, where do you see Jesus? Where do you see Jesus? So what does Jesus say about the commandments? And he says there's two. Love the Lord your God and love one another. On this, you can hang all the laws, all of it. It's crazy to think that if we love God with all of our heart and we love each other as ourselves, do you realize we'd never go to jail? We'd never be in any kind of trouble because that's what the Bible says. You can hang all the law on it. If you love one another and you love God, you're not going to break any command. You're not going to break any moral laws. You're not going to be in trouble. Things are going to go a little bit smoother. All right. Next is walk in my ways. A road trodden means walk down, to tread, to place your feet. To move, you gotta move, you gotta step, you gotta go. Another word for it is the course of life or a mode of action. What's your mode of action? What's your mode? How are you loving the Lord with all your heart? How are you loving each other? What's your mode of action? Are you reaching out or you stay reaching in? The next one was, the next sentence is, and do what is right in my sight. And at first, I, that kind of freaked me out because it's like, Lord, you, your word says your ways are higher than mine. My understanding's not yours. How am I going to know what's right in your sight? What if, I me- what if I miss that? What if I mess that up? But think about it. Even a baby who's sneaking a cookie, they know it's in us. We know what's right. It, 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 it's in there. It's that God part because we're made in his image. We're made to do things right. We're created and designed to do righteously. We're created and designed to be holy. We are the temple. This is what his word says. So one of the one of the words for and do what is right in my sight and that right the word is yashar and one of the words is convenient and I was like Lord doing right is not always convenient because I know sharing your word tonight is right but it's not convenient <laughs> this is <laughs> this is not convenient but it is it is it, it, because when we do what's right, we're not always picking up the pieces from the consequences. So therefore, doing right is convenient. It saves me a lot of hassle because that's where some, some of us suffer the most. It's, we, we meet Jesus and we want to change. But man, we got so much crop failure to pray for and consequences to live out. Didn't matter if I I received Jesus. I still had to get sober. I still had to stop fornicating. I still had to stop doing drugs. I still had to work it out. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so keep my statues and my commandments. Statues is an appointed time, a customary time. Jesus went to the 
the temple at an appointed time and it was customary and we're learning we have these appointed times but what about the appointed times when God says okay this is your appointed time now it's time for you to step in it's time for you to step up this is the time that I have appointed for you we always want to go, oh, that's their appointed time. They're going to do something great for God, but God's got an appointed time for you. Ecclesiastics says that to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. What is our purpose right now? Because God's not just wasting time. God's not just throwing us in the storm and saying, well, let's see how they handle this. He's got purpose in this. You know, there's just purpose, and it's good purpose because God says that his plans are to pro prosper us and to give us a hope for a future and an end, an expected end. And we have that expected end. We know where we're going but let's walk out that eternity right here and right now because we don't have to wait to heaven to walk in our authority. We don't have to wait to heaven to feel joy and happiness. We have that here and now. All right, so, all right, so... So he's telling us, keep his statutes, keep his ways as his servant did. Well, let's talk. If we got to be like David, let's talk about David. And what's the first thing everybody says about David? David was a man after God's own heart. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. David was a shepherd called to be a king. He was a young child. But he had purpose in his family. He was the shepherd of the sheep in the family. He was a young boy, but he was obedient to his father, and his father gave him a purpose. What's your purpose in this family? Where's your place? David was anointed king, but he didn't operate in that for a long time and sometimes when you come into the church and you give your life to Christ and people start speaking over you and you're going to be a prophet you've been called to the nations God's going to anoint your mouth you're going to be an evangelist and we woohoo we want to serve the Lord and we take off running but we've got no roots no foundation we fall fast don't Know your calling, but give yourself time to grow into it. Don't run, because you'll fall. Keep the word in you. Build your foundation. And let God move you. You know, they always say, God will open doors for you. And we're like, woohoo, open them doors, Jesus. Well, let me tell you a secret. When they open... You better be prepared to walk through them because it's kind of scary when these doors start opening. <laughs> so, so as you pray for those open doors, remember you will have to walk through them at some point or time. What else do we know about David? He was a worshiper. He was a worshiper to the point that he made a fool of himself out in the streets. I love it. I love it. He knew how to dance. And guys, all the girls like the guys who know how to dance. You know, and that's, and David was, uh, let's see. So one of the things that, about David that I want to mention is as a shepherd boy, think about it. You're out in the field with the sheep. You're isolated, you're exposed to the elements, and you're alone. But in that place is where David learned how to worship God. So, you know what? We're in, we have some really nasty atmosphere and elements around us right now. We're in some, we're in some difficult times. 
but we're learning how to pray like we've never prayed before. We are worshiping. We're not just worshiping here on Sunday mornings. We're, we're worshiping in spirit and truth. We're worshiping as a lifestyle. Not just something we come visit, but we're living worship. David even served a king who tried to kill him. You ever feel like your family members are trying to kill you? And you're, mm, kids, you still got to serve them? Serve one another. It's not easy to serve everybody. You're not going to love everybody. You're not going to like everybody. And everybody's not going to like you. But that's okay. Because we'll just say we're going to be like David and his mighty men. You know who his mighty men were? 1 Samuel 22 says David had 400 mighty men. You know who they were? They were the distressed ones. All the men that were distressed. The men that were in debt. And the men that were discontent. Well, ain't that a strong group of men? Woohoo! That's just what I want. But this is the army that David conquered with. So what can he do with us? You know? We're not that bad, are we? Right? So let, let God do something with us. So David was a player. And he could be. They, all, they said the women said he was beautiful. He danced. We all love a man who dances. He worshiped. We all love men that worship God. I mean, the women loved him. He was a player. He could have had anybody he wanted. And he gave in to his flesh, and he gave in and took what he wanted. It didn't belong to him. David sinned. He loved God. He worshiped God. He was a mighty man, but he still couldn't conquer his flesh. His flesh is a nasty thing. But when it was pointed out to David, that he had sinned. He didn't blame God. He didn't get arrogant and say, well, I'm the king. I can have whatever I want. He humbled himself. He repented. He grieved. But there was still consequences. He had a child out of that lust of the flesh, the flesh that he couldn't conquer brought in another life. But God said, I'm not going to let you have that life. And he could have got mad at God. He could have stomped his feet. He could have walked away. But David humbled himself. He repented. And then he got back up. So that's what I'm going to ask of all of you tonight. Don't get stuck in your sin. Don't get stuck where you are. It's heavy. It feels like the muck and the mire. It feels uncomfortable. Don't get stuck there. Receive the blood of Jesus. Let him wash you white as snow. Accept his forgiveness. Accept his hand lifting you up. Brush yourself off and try again. Don't quit. Don't faint. Don't give up. Seek after God with all your heart. Follow his commandments. He mentioned the commandments twice, so better, we better look at another commandment. Since there's four gospels, let's look at commandment number four. Don't forsake the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Come to church. Set a day aside for the Lord. Make him a priority. Put him first. And let him build you a house that will endure. In Jesus' name. Oh, let's keep her up here. Amen. Woo. Amen. Let's give it a shout. Amen. Amen.
Whew. Debbie, I took four pages of notes, <laughs> and I couldn't write fast enough. Wasn't this rich? Don't we feel our hearts encouraged and enriched tonight? We received value. Amen. We've heard what is our purpose. How many of you heard something from Holy Spirit tonight, kind of resharpening and refocusing in on the purpose? I did. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we thank you. I'm so proud. <laughs> oh, Me too. I did it. You did it. <laughs> Amen. So, Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that we have listened to keep you first, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We thank you that you are building within us, in our hearts, in our homes, and in our church. We give you honor. We give you praise. Father, we pray for a, a special anointing and blessing upon Debbie and Sean and their family. Father, we thank you that their hearts are rich in love towards you. We thank you for their family, that all the days of their lives, they're going to think upon the good things and give praise to you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's all go home safely. Amen. Rejoicing. I heard from Holy Spirit, and I know you did too, because I can see the faces. Everyone on live stream, thank you for joining in tonight, and God bless you. Amen. 5 a.m. for Clubhouse. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>